Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome back. Once again, you're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. I'm your host, Jeremiah Fox. We're going live from Brooklyn, New York today. I'm sitting in my restaurant, Della, on Prospect Avenue in Brooklyn, in a spot that my guest has spent many evenings at, one of his favorite places in Brooklyn. Before I bring my guest in today, I want to give you the message of the week. This comes from the indupliticable, however you say that, unable to duplicate Gary Vaynerchuk. He released a short film earlier this week, and uh, he's not necessarily a real estate guy, although his, uh, his sister is, and she's been on the show. But he said this really great quote about building something that he heard a long time ago. He said, I think about succeeding in one very simple story. There's two ways to build the biggest building in town. One, you either just build the biggest building in town, or two, you build a decent sized building and spend all of your time tearing down everyone else's building. Unfortunately, 95% of people try to do number two, but not my guest today. He's a real estate agent. He's a Halstead broker, actually, uh, here in Brooklyn. And the dude is super positive, and he's just always looking up. He's never looking down. With that, I would like to introduce Tyson Lewis. Tyson, are you here? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't see you, though. I can't see my screen is frozen, but <laughs> that's all right. It'll here. catch you up. Can hear me? Then so be it. Uh, maybe do you have pants on? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I was gonna say maybe that's the problem. Hopefully the uh, the video catches up because if not, everybody gets to just look at my ugly mug <laughs> for the whole show. Um, <laughs> how you doing today? I'm doing just fine. How are you? Awesome. Outstanding. So this is another thing that I I read. Uh, I was I was talking to you yesterday about um, just a plethora of articles that are coming out lately, and people are like going crazy on Facebook with. This is something from CNN Business that I read yesterday, and uh, it said during the months that the coronavirus shut down NYC, the real estate market came to a halt. That changes on Monday. Phase two, June 22nd, when the city reopens at a broader level and the local real estate market effectively flips the lights back on. But will the market ever be the same? That is a question we are going to try to answer at some point during this show. I don't need your complete thoughts on that just yet. But why don't you start by introducing yourself to our listener and viewership uh, and tell everybody... Like where are you from? Where you grew up? How'd you get into real estate? What other silly things have you done along the way? Well, uh, my name is Tyson Lewis. I'm an associate broker with Halstead, which is now actually merged with Brown Harris Stevens as of a few days ago. So we are trying to figure out what we're calling ourselves at the moment. But I've been a real oh, estate. Oh wow! Yep. Um, very exciting. Uh, I've been a real estate agent for about almost exactly twelve years. Um, before that, I was a pretty active musician. I still am a musician, but uh, real estate has kind of taken, come to the forefront. Um, well, you actually make money now, right? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I had kids and <laughs> needed to support someone besides just myself. Um, I was, um, I'm from Connecticut, but I've lived in New York City for about 20 years. And uh, I've been in Brooklyn for about 16 of those years. And uh, you went to school in Vermont, correct? I went to college at the University of Vermont in Burlington. And what did you and, study uh, there? I studied anthropology. <laughs> <laughs> With, uh, I, what, I, what I really want to know is how does that apply to real estate? <laughs> I'm not sure if it, I mean, anthropology applies to anything involving humans. So, okay. you know, we could get really deep into that. Um, but, uh, you know, when I was studying that, this, this was not the goal I had. I was actually planning to go to law, law school. Um, oh. so, um, so how does anthropology apply to law school? Well, anthropology. I'm kidding, man. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it Nobody's was a liberal arts education. You know, nobody knew what they were doing. We were just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, no, nobody's meandered more than me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and and then the music thing, how did that come into play? Like, I actually went to school for music. I studied it, you know, I have two degrees in it. Um, and again, don't do not do anything monetarily with it. 
at least not at the moment. I might make a comeback. I might put the band back together. <laughs> uh, uh, we actually that? might as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> about that. But um, I, um, well, I've been a piano player. I started playing the piano when I was five years old, and I'm 46 now. Um, mm -hmm. And then when I came back to New York City from Vermont, I started taking it a little more seriously and got involved in a couple of different bands and um, ended up joining up with um, a band called Hopewell that uh, was based in upstate New York and had moved down to New York City. And um, we had a really good run of touring and playing actively for, I don't know, 10 years. Yeah. I think the 10 year, I was probably with the band eight of those 10 years. Um, um. And then I, uh, you know, I needed a career path and I, and I, I figured, you know, real estate is something that I could do where I could still go on tour and I could set my own hours and have complete control of my life and complete freedom. Turned out that was not even remotely true, but uh, <laughs> I fell in love with, with selling real estate. So here That's I That's awesome. And, and prior to that, had you done anything that was kind of like in sales and uh, entrepreneurial like and, and business? Um, not that I could talk about on, on a radio show. <laughs> it's okay. I, I no, confess, no, that, really I confess no, I, that I used to sell weed on our first show. I, Sam was like, the executive producer was interviewing me and he was like, what was the first thing that you did as like a hustle? And I was like, yeah, I sold weed in middle school. Look, you don't I lived in Burlington, to Vermont to. for nine years. How much more do you want me to say? That's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was a mule. But, uh, he was a Canadian mule. No, aside from that, no, nothing really um, entrepreneurial. I, I was a paralegal for a while. That's hardly entrepreneurial. What's that? I was a paralegal for a oh, while. Yeah, yeah. That's hardly entrepreneurial. No. No. And uh, then, I mean, I, I, I don't really... Um, I never saw myself as a, a self motivator. Uh, I never saw myself as someone who was going to be building their own business. I, I was always just trying to find something that I could fit into that I enjoyed enough to keep doing. And uh, the spirit of being a real estate agent, the spirit of what we do every day really kind of captured me and um, started a new chapter in my life. That's crazy. So what, what does one have to do? I know you were kind of explaining to me last night, just like for your basic license, but what is the whole, like, what's the progression like going from like, I don't do anything in it to like the broker level? Hmm. I think Tyson's taking a little break. <laughs> it's that time. Um, so one of the things while he's while he's uh, collecting his thoughts and putting his pants back on um, is a little inside joke. We we've had uh, we, we have regular meetups close to my restaurant uh, in Brooklyn as things have shut down. Uh, he's also uh, his he's his firm is with uh, Alexandra Segir, who's another super local lady lives here in the neighborhood in Windsor Terrace and just really active in the community. Um, both of their kids uh, have gone to local schools and they've just participated in a huge way in, in the operation of the community and the schools and everything. And when you sell uh, real estate um, in, in, a, in an area like this, it behooves you as a real estate agent. And this, it was a big learning lesson for me uh, in terms of how to, how to build a brand. Real estate people really do a great job with it because they're, they're, they're participating, especially if they live in the area that they're they're selling homes in. They really, I mean, they participate in a huge way in the way the community operates. And they they know all the businesses. I mean, it's just it's really fascinating to me coming from you know just a guy that was like literally started as a dishwasher and working my way up, and then at some point became an owner. Uh, I was I was completely ignorant to that, and and they've all fascinated me uh, with their with their participation in the community. So we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we're gonna we're gonna rope Tyson back in. We're gonna find him. We're gonna shackle him down. And make sure he has pants on, and uh, we'll get we'll try to get the video and everything locked back in. We'll be back in just a few. Everybody, you're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. Fun start to the show today. What do they say? It ain't a party until something gets broke. Tyson, are you with us? 
I'm here. Sorry about that. Finally, you guys don't have to stare at my ugly face anymore for the whole time. He's he's more handsome than I am. He gets his hair cut. You got an uh, underground haircut guy, right? You had somebody <laughs> like... <laughs> oh, it felt great. It was amazing. Speakeasy haircuts. We don't have to do that anymore. Starting Monday. That's amazing. Yeah, that's what they're telling us. Yeah. That's what they're saying. So could you hear what I was saying at, at just before the, the last break? I was talking about... Well, I, I missed the last minute or so. I confess my just love to me you out. publicly. I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, I was talking about how you like people like you and Alexandra in particular, you're 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 nestled in the community strongly. You you know, your kids go to the local schools. You guys I, I'm just fascinated um, by the way uh, real estate people, especially in an area like where we live. I'm not sure if it's like that in, in other parts of the, the country and uh, parts of the state or even parts of the city, but the active role people like yourselves play in the community, like shaping it almost. I mean, you're, it's, it's remarkable in the way you all interact with local businesses and property values. And it's, it's just fascinating. Um, do you want to talk about that for a moment? And then we can kind of double back and go back to like be, being a real estate person, or we can flip flop it, whatever you, whatever you feel like. Sure. Well, um, you, you know, I, I'll just speak for myself, but I think I could speak a little bit for Alexandra. We, we are really, um, you know, as you mentioned, we we raise our families in our community. We frequent the local restaurants like yours. You know, I'm sitting our, in your seat right now. <laughs> <with my seat. laughs> um, just keeping it warm. Yeah, I mean, we are fully integrated in the community. It's it's for us. It's it's. Um, you know, our business is not transactional. It's uh, it's about relationships. It's about um, you know supporting our community and being part of it. Sometimes giving back. Obviously, this is our job. This is how we make our money. But at the same time, um, you know, it's more than just a transaction for us. And uh, we we live our lives that way. Uh, we run our business that way. Uh, we frequently. Um, look for creative ways to be part of the community besides just selling your home. Yeah. We, we have concert series. We are, unfortunately our concert series this summer was canceled. We did one last year that it was a great success and it was a lot of fun and it was just really good vibes all around. And, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't translate directly into sales numbers or dollar signs. It can't be measured in crude statistics, but it can definitely, you can feel that, it's important and hmm. absolutely 100 percent um so then backing it up going from like not being involved in real estate at all to the point where you're at now what's that what's that timeline like what are some of the things one must do if, if they wanted to follow in your your kingly footsteps <laughs> well it, you know it's not for everybody <laughs> you when you start out as a real estate agent, you're probably not going to make any money for quite a while. So make sure you save some. And like how long? How long are we talking? Well, it depends on. There's no way to answer that. I mean, I mean, it depends on how motivated you are, yeah. how quickly you figure out a system that works for you. Um, you might need to just get lucky here and there. Um, the thing about it is, every single person that we know has to live somewhere. And whether they're renting, whether they're buying, they're selling, those are all points where we can connect with those people and um, turn that into a living. Um, and um, the faster you can get good at doing that, the more chance you have of, of having success. I mean, I mean, there are people that that hit the ground running and have great success right away. It took right. me. I did okay, but it took me a couple of years to really figure out how to have the conversations the right way, how to be comfortable with. There's a lot of information. New York City real estate is very, very complicated. Right. Uh, and there are a lot of nuances to it. And, um, you know, and to that point, um, you know, I've been doing this 12 years. I feel like I have a pretty good amount of success under my belt, but. I never stop learning. I'm constantly going to seminars and learning, um, and 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 going to classes and um, continuing to educate myself. And I think that's something that you have to have. You have to want to learn. You have to be curious. 
um, in order to do this job effectively. So the, you have to start with some tests as well. You were telling me last night, it's like, you know, you got to take some courses and, and, uh, and pass the test, but it's not extremely intellectual. As long as you, you do your work, you can pass the test. And then, and then a, 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 probably a couple of years where you're not really bringing it, where it's not like fully supporting you and you'll, you'll need like another side hustle or money put aside to kind of weather the storm. And then, then you might get some uh, wind under your sails. Is that? Yeah. I mean, the think about it. it. If you're selling your home, I mean, in New York city, you could probably close your eyes and throw a rock and hit a real estate agent. Right. Yeah. So if you're selling your home, <laughs> it's your most important asset. It's where you, you know, it financially. And it's also, you know, you're trusting someone to be in your home. You're trusting them to handle the transaction the right way. There's a lot of things going on beyond, beyond the scenes that as a seller, you're not going to see. Yeah. Uh, so why are you going to give that business to somebody who's never done it before or who's only done it twice? Mm -hmm. You know, it takes a lot of trust. It takes, you know, um, so, you know, for me, it was about learning, not just learning the business, but also feeling confident enough to have the conversations with clients, whether they're buyers or sellers or, or what have you. Um, and I, I, you know, people can sense when you, when you're faking it. Yeah. Or when you're, like you said, when you're just transactional, when you're just like, I'll sell your home, like, which is how I just imagined all real estate people being prior to like getting to know a number of you. <laughs> some of them are, I mean, some of them are, and it really, yeah, right. one of the cool things about the business is that there are so many different types of personalities and, and they're not, you can be lots of different types of real estate agents. Yeah. Um, for me, you know, I'm not, I'm not salesy, but some people are, and that works for them. Yeah. Um, but, and we have all different types of clients and that's the thing, you know, there are some people that are just looking at numbers. It's it, this property they're selling. is just an investment. This property they're buying is just an investment. What's the cap rate? What's my return on investment going to look like? And then there are people that, yeah, sure. They care about the money. They care about the numbers, but it's, they know it's the place where their kid's going to feel safe, where they're going to spend most of their time, where they're really going to build memories and, and build something. And, and for those people, um, you know, it's more of a balance between the, the, the investment standpoint and the, yeah. the right. personal. Right. And you have to, you have to, as an agent, you have to be nimble. You have to read what's happening. You have to figure out what's important to your clients and really not just figure it out and use it, but really believe that it's important. You know, yeah. it's important. Yeah, that's great. Um, so once you got, once you became a real estate agent, mm -hmm. tell us about the transition to the broker level and what that looks like. Um, I think that the, 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 the rules have changed a little bit since I did it. Uh, a broker is just, you start out as a licensed sales agent and then you get a certain amount of experience and you can take a broker test and become a broker. So it's really just kind of a higher level of yeah. education. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the what the requirements are these days. I think they're a little less than what I what I had to go through. There was a big point system, and I had to record all my transactions and take a test. You know. It, and what does that allow you going from uh, like just an agent to being a broker? What does that offer you? What's the incentive for doing that? Um, for me, it was just, I wanted to show my clients and I wanted to show myself that I, um, that it was important to me to, to take, take it to the next level, to, um, further educate myself. Uh, there's no real difference in terms of what we do day to day. And we all, right. you know, there are agents that are a lot more experienced than me that never become brokers. It's, it's not uh -huh. really, you know, it's. It, if you are a broker, technically you can open an, your own office and hire people. I guess that's one thing. But. Right, right. I thought there was something to that effect. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't have. You wouldn't I have, have no to stay. On doing that. <laughs> so do you have to stay under the umbrella of a of a larger company like Halstead and Corcoran? 
when you when you first become an agent, you have to associate yourself with a company. They don't just right. set you loose on the world. Thank right. God. <laughs> um, you're supposed to, you know, have some kind of mentorship and some kind of, you know. Yeah. So, but you you can go off on your own if you become a broker. Uh, know people that have done it. Uh, there are a lot of independent brokers in New York City. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, for me, I, I like being part of a, a company that has the. I don't want to be an IT guy. I don't want to, you know, I want marketing tools. I want all kinds of stuff that big companies can offer. And, right. You know, I'm not a I'm not a manager. I just want to do my part of the store. Right. So that's one of the benefits of that. And we, when you were at the focus group that we had here back in the fall, you talked about that um, at length, right? That, you know, they handle like you can direct people to the, their website. It's, you know, you're associated with it, but they take care of all of that kind of outreach where you deal with like your own social media and so forth. But, but on the larger picture, they just create this, this huge amount of reach for you. It's that a It's a, it's a foundation yeah. you can build on and you can be sure you can, you can get really heavily involved in designing your own marketing materials and you can take it, you can do that if you want to, uh, but it's nice to know that, you know, the technology in real estate is always changing constantly. Yeah. And especially lately, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's going to be more important than ever to stay at the forefront of technological mm -hmm. innovation in this business. And yeah. um, I know people that have left big companies and opened their own shops and then end up going back because they were like, I just, I couldn't even be a real estate agent because I was constantly having to be an IT guy and learn how to do yeah. new and learn new programs and new technology just to keep up with the big companies. So for me, I don't, you know, I don't. Yeah, have any Ain't nobody got time for that. So besides, I know, I know, you know, the virtual thing became really popular uh, since March, where people were, you know, doing virtual tours virtual. of homes. Some people were, were buying uh, houses and, and properties unseen. Mm -hmm. um, bes besides that, what what are some of the other like? just things that you have to keep up with that are from the technological standpoint uh, in the real estate industry, you know, that just like are constantly changing and, but just really make your job and your life easier and give you a good reach. Well, I mean, first of all, let me just say, I'm not sure we even know yet what <laughs> is going to be important in the next, start, even right. the next month. So I would say like over the last but, but year, just, we can just, yeah. but we know that, um, you know, having the ability to take a nice video of a property or mm -hmm. do it virtually was, has been an option for years, but when it became a requirement that we were not allowed to actually physically enter apartments and, and show them, um, that became a, a, you know, it kind of separated out the people that were taking the, the crappy cell phone videos. And I took a couple of those too. And I quickly learned, I was like, we, Whoa, we've all done it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, um, you know, you're presenting, you're selling someone's biggest asset. It's so important. Presentation is everything. The presentation gives credibility to what you're doing. You know, mm -hmm. um, you could have the most beautiful home on earth. And if it's presented with crappy photos and, you know, no floor plan and, and, you know, you're going to lose some of your target audience. It's going to decrease the pool of prospective buyers for that property. And so, some of the new video stuff that's come out is really cool. I mean, we can get really in depth with it, but um, 3D cameras, I, I bought one that was recommended to me and I think it's already almost outdated and I bought it two months ago. Wow. Uh, the, the, the quality, you know, one thing, you know, the, the COVID situation has been terrible, but if there is a silver lining to some of this is that um, it's forced some of the technology to really, to really um, improve. Yeah. Um, on all fronts so, that you're seeing that on, on so many industries. It's just like, right. It, the, your back was put against the wall and it was like, this has to happen now or, or we're going to crumble. And all of us are trying to prevent that from happening. Cool. Yep. We're going to take another break, man. Don't, don't go away this time. Keep, I won't. Don't touch anything. Okay. All right, everybody. We'll be back in just a minute. You're listening to the entrepreneurial web. All right, everybody. Welcome back again. You're listening to the entrepreneurial web. I'm your host, Jeremiah Fox here with my guest, Halstead, Brooklyn-based real estate broker, Tyson Lewis. Tyson, did you mess with your video or audio? 
I have not touched the thing. I have not moved. I'll catch you. Nice. <laughs> Good to have you back. Good to see you again. Thank um, you. So you said you started out 12 years ago. Were you were you already an agent during the the, the real estate bubble pop that happened uh, 2007? No, I made I had the bright idea that I would become an agent right as that was happening, uh, and people thought I was a little crazy. Um, well, you I, are, but I, yeah, maybe. Um, but you know, it didn't even occur to me that that was a big deal until. It's, when I was looking around to see who I wanted to work with, they were like, why are you doing this right now? Um, but, you know, um, it was actually a great way to prove myself. I mean, I, yeah. I, you know, I feel like if I could do it then and learn the business then during that horrible crisis, then. And survive, right? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty similar I mean, feeling right now. We'll say, I will say, you know, the market that I was working in, which was predominantly Park Slope at that time, um, is always a little bit insulated from broader yeah. market conditions. Yeah, it was bad. Uh, things cooled off for a little while, but you know, Brooklyn is what it is, and and we re we rebound pretty quickly. Right. And so, how would you compare that to uh, what's happening right now? Because it seems somewhat similar. Like all these articles and reports are just like everybody's leaving New York, everybody's leaving New York, like New Jersey's hopping, Connecticut's hopping, you know, Florida, you know, people are like migrating south and everything. And when I talk to people like you, you're like, yeah, but Brooklyn's, Brooklyn's hot. <laughs> Brooklyn's good. First of all, um, what happened in, in 2008, 2009 was a housing crisis. Right. It was directly related to housing. This is not a housing crisis. This is a global health crisis that you know, obviously affects almost every type of business in some way. Um, and of course affected housing just like any other business. But um, the reasons that people um, move, the reasons people buy and sell, those things haven't changed. You know, right. yes, there are people uh, that have left New York City. You know, when you read all the stuff in the press, yeah, I don't know everything. I don't have, I, we don't have enough data to show you right now, but my yeah. sense is that when they're talking about people fleeing the city, we're talking about Manhattan. Yeah, uh, We are very much the suburbs out here in Brooklyn of Manhattan. We don't feel like we're in the suburbs, but we are. Uh, it's a we, big, are it's a, a uh, we are seeing a pretty healthy migration of, of buyers coming out from Manhattan who are thinking, you know, oh, I could spend $3 million on a on a three bedroom condo in Midtown, or I can spend $3 million and get a beautiful brownstone with a backyard, you right. know, and still be a, in a relatively short commute. So I, the, some of the stuff we're hearing is a little bit skewed, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure, there are people, I am also licensed in Connecticut. I, I do business there and it is, it has become very hot. I'm sure New Jersey is the same way. Yeah. Uh, and increasingly, you know, as people change the way that they work, I mean, you know, I, I think that fewer people are going to have to commute every single day. So that's going to affect the housing market. But yeah, then we're in Brooklyn. Um, I've never been so busy in my life. Never. Uh, we are and we're hearing this from all of our agents. We have a really healthy, robust network of the top real estate agents in Brooklyn. We're all, we all kind of know each other and everybody's saying the same thing. Everybody's so busy. Buyers are coming out of the woodwork. Interest rates are at historic lows. Um, and so, I don't know, we'll see, I guess on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> How hot uh, it really is. <laughs> my sense is that it's going to be, you know, there was a really healthy balance of supply and demand right before COVID happened. Right. Uh, and we have, you know, a dozen listings waiting to hit the market. They were going to be launched in April and May, and they were all, they're all kind of just waiting for things to open back up again. Those are all still happening. Um, and, and a huge roster of buyers who are just waiting to get out there and see properties. You know, mm -hmm. we're doing as much video and virtual stuff as we can, but you know, no one's going to spend a million dollars on something without actually seeing it. So, right. Um, that's not true, actually. That's, the, a couple people. Yeah, I, I told <laughs> There's a couple. <laughs> I'd unseen last year, and um, that was kind of nerve wracking. But yeah, what generally sure. people want to see what they're buying. And and you don't sell or anything in Manhattan. You're you're strictly broken. Uh, I do. Or, you do. I do. I mean, my business is book. 
uh, is based here in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is big enough on its own. I mean, I think a couple of years ago it eclipsed Chicago in population. Right. So just Brooklyn. <laughs> own borough, it would be the fourth biggest city. I mean, its own city, it would be the fourth biggest city in the United States. So I, yeah. you know, we have a lot here. I don't, you know, I feel like it's better to be really good at a, a specific area rather than um, spreading yourself too thin. However, of course, there's a lot of migration back and forth. We just closed yesterday uh, a co-op on Park Avenue. So, um, you know, we get it up, we, like we go there, and we have a we have another condo listing up coming up in uh, Manhattan. So we do go there. It's just our our focus is here. Yeah, it seems like, I, and I'm just guessing because I don't know shit about uh, real estate really, besides the information I get from you and people like you. But if, from an investment standpoint, buying in Manhattan may be a good move over the next like six months. Our our prices go are are they dipping a little bit there because there's more inventory? I I probably I don't think I think it's too soon to tell really right I think that that's why know, I gave myself again, a six month window <laughs> yeah again if you were somebody who wants to sell your home um and you, unless you absolutely have to why would you launch that listing in the middle of COVID when we're not even allowed to show property right so I right. think that um when we always tell our sellers you know we know what what we have a rough valuation. We know generally the ballpark of where we should be priced, but we always continue to have that pricing conversation up until the day we launch it, because there's always new data that might inform your pricing. Mm -hmm. You know, another apartment might pop up in the building at the same time that might change the way we think about things. So um, I, I just don't think that we even know um, really what the prices are going to look like even next week. Right. <laughs> So it sounds like a lot of gear shifting, like, right? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, of course, if, if um, you know, if there's a lot of inventory, then the prices are going to have to be a little bit more competitive. Right. And so I'm sure that any agents who are talking to prospective sellers in Manhattan are having that conversation. You know, you're going to have to be realistic about this and we're going to have to be nimble and be willing to test the market at a number and then maybe quickly decide if that's not working, be willing to have a conversation about that and adjust. Yeah. So a little more trial and error and, and just like really feeling things out coming, going forward. Yeah. Because we be pricing on, on the most recent data, the most recent data right now is suspect at best. I don't think it's even really telling us much of a story. So yeah. there's a lot of uh, decisions being made from the gut right now. Yeah. And, and, but it's so far, it hasn't been a, a, pr a drastic price drop. Like, no, in, I mean, in, if in you're on the market, you know, if, if you're on, we had a, a house that was on the market that came on in March and then COVID really uh, blew up and mm -hmm. she really needed to sell and, you know, she elected to stay on the market and we had to really adjust the price to get that done. But yeah. um, generally speaking, Right, more singular, which that's something that would happen anytime, right? Like just life gets in the way and things happen and you just got to short sell. But those are just like more like uh, singular instances, right, at the moment yeah. so far. I don't and, think that, I mean, I'm sure there are lots of agents that will disagree with me. Uh, but I don't think that we're going to notice a huge discount in prices. Right. You know, some people are well, talking about maybe 10%, but I, I don't even see that really. I mean, right, we're, right. I'm involved in three bidding wars as we sit here and, mm -hmm. you know. Right. You said there were like bidding wars on rentals, right? Bidding up. <laughs> uh, we have to, it's a bidding. Well, it, you know, anything that had, um, especially in the middle of COVID, like in like April and, and May, uh, anything that had outdoor space suddenly got a lot more attractive to right. people. So, um, and we were seeing, you know, a lot of people who are coming out from Manhattan who just want to find a rental and they're, they're accustomed to seeing rents that are much higher. Yeah. So, you know, what we thought of as a high rent out here didn't seem so high to them and they're, they're laughing at it, really <laughs> throw a couple hundred dollars more on it. And yeah. So. Damn. <laughs> um, but it's all, but gonna, it's, it's going to all sort itself out. The, the history of the New York City real estate market is always an upward trajectory. I think 
think the median sale price has gone up every year since like the 70s. Right. You know, it's, it's, you know, yes, there are always ups and downs, but um, New York rebounds. And, and especially our area of Brooklyn, um, you know, as long as the park is wonderful, as long as there are height restrictions on the buildings and it's hard to create a lot of new inventory, um, as long as, you know, people still find the schools to be very desirable, Mm-hmm. You know, those things are always going to drive the market. And I'm... Classic Tyson, being positive. I love it. Um, and then how does the, the situation with people, um, you know, I read some statistic about like 25% of New Yorkers didn't pay rent in May. I, don't, I didn't hear anything about June, but between, um, you know, back rent or mortgages, uh, do you see that playing any major factor or uh, just again, more like bumps in the roadway as we go forward. I mean, I don't know. I haven't seen any data on the rents. I mean, I, I hear that. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I'm sure that, you know, there are a lot of people that are in a very difficult spot right now. And, you know, we, we told, we've always, we've been telling our landlord clients, you know, this is not a time to be very difficult. This is a time where we yeah. should all be more tolerant of each other. Mm-hmm. And, and, Yes, we know that you need this income to pay your mortgage, and you know. But if you can help the tenant out, if you can give them a little bit of a break, if you can let them put off some of their payment till later. I mean, in the end, the rent is due. There's, right. There's, no, there's, no, such there's been no no forgiveness as far as that goes. Oh, I mean, um, and and with the mortgages, so, you know, there was a, um, the, you know, banks were being very lenient with people on their payments but at the end of the day those payments are going to be due so yeah i, I, just was, don't, I don't know how it's what the long-term effect of that is going to be right I, and and most of that was was just for residential right like private property owners they weren't offering that to uh commercial property owners or if you were a landlord um of a building and you had tenants like not necessarily any commercial but you owned like an eight unit building they were they were the bank but were the lenders really offering them anything every lender is different somewhere right. somewhere i think it maybe it okay. depends on the relationship with the bank and mm-hmm. the situation is you know i don't think i can just give a, a blanket answer that covers every situation yeah it seemed from what i gathered like commercial property owners got nothing they were just like no your your mortgage is due on your building so you need to talk to your um, at you the know, same time, though, I at the same time, though, I, I've heard really nice stories of commercial property landlords uh, just giving breaks to businesses yeah. that have, you know, been in institutions in the neighborhood and been in, in place for a while. And, you know, recognizing that, yeah, this sucks for everybody and I'm not going to, you know, destroy your business because, you know, yeah technically your rent is due, you know, right. It's, right. Again, it's time that we all have to be a little bit more lean with each other and tolerant and try, and I have to, a, try to help as, as much as we can. Yeah. I have a feeling going forward, like basically anybody signing commercial leases from today onward is going to write some kind of, you know, pandemic response into the riders just to protect both parties, not to be like, Hey, if this happens again, I'm, I'm off the hook for my rent, but some, bit of negotiation because right now there's nothing, you know, I mean, it's no different than like a good guy clause, you know, no businesses just went under that. Finally, you know, you were able to write a good guy clause into a, a, a lease and, and both parties got to kind of, you know, smoothly and seamlessly uh, adjust. I feel like the same will be go will be true going forward um, in terms of signing commercial leases, because how can you, you know, how can you get into like a five, 10 year lease? I mean, the chances are something like this will happen again. Now that we've been through round one, there has to be some kind of, I feel like there needs to be some kind of appropriate response from both parties, especially if the government's not going to offer anything. You know, they're, they're just like, oh, uh, I don't know. Good yeah, luck. I mean, I, this is wading into attorney territory because any commercial yeah. lease, we would have an attorney be working yep. on that. But mm-hmm. we are seeing definitely COVID language being inserted into contracts for yeah. leases and contracts. For, yeah, for sale. Even and for for home home purchases as well. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So all of you listening, <laughs> get that good attorney, get that one that knows what's going on. 
All right, it's, we're going to take uh, one more. This is not the time to be cheaping out on your attorney. Get the yeah, best. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it'd, it'd be really costly. All right, we're going to take another break. One more. We'll be back in just a minute, everybody listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. All right, everybody, we're back again, the Entrepreneurial Web. I'm your host, Jeremiah Fox, with my guest, Tyson Lewis. He is a Halstead, Brooklyn based real estate broker. We've been discussing the New York City real estate situation in general, some history, how to become a real estate agent in this wonderful town. But now, Monday, June 22nd, phase two, apparently real estate agents can start to show homes again, restaurants. I was just looking out front and fantasizing about being able to put tables outside. We can apparently seat outside. You can get your nails done. You can get your hair done. I haven't heard about tattoos yet. Do you know anything about tattoos? Tyson, I'm up. I'm due for hey, one. I'm not the person to ask about tattoos. <laughs> um, I would like pumped? to have a table outside of your restaurant, though, because I'm tired of standing. Would. Yeah, because standing out there sucks for hours. Right? Oh, well. <laughs> yes, worse. fingers crossed. Um, and you said you were, you were given communication by a, a state lobby group or a local lobby group, at least. At, that deals with the state that in fact green light for real estate agents you may start showing again you've gotten you've gotten the pass we heard from i actually heard it on the news yesterday but um we heard the real estate board of new york uh notifies the brokerages the member yeah. brokers and, and that all trickled down to us as agents i got a, a an email uh to the restaurant this morning saying it's a go, you know, there's a number of guidelines and stipulations that we have to follow, but it seems like phase two is in effect. Are you pumped? Uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited. I mean, I, I'm not somebody who likes to sit still. And right. I mean, Same here. I, not to say that I haven't been busy. We, we have been, like I said, busier than ever before, uh, but busy in a different way, you know, right. and it feels like there's a lot of pent up energy just waiting to come out. I mean, spring is our selling season. Spring is when we, yeah. you know, March, April, May, June is the, you know, the highlight of our year. Same and here. Same here. Passing us by while we sit <laughs> right and stare at our screens. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty pumped. Uh, I, there's going to be, I, I think we're still trying to figure out what all the guidelines are and what they mm -hmm. mean. Yeah. Um, you know, they're not going to be, we're not going to have, open houses yeah uh and i think that's wise for some time yeah. so uh, you know there'll be open houses by appointment but right at least we can you know legally show property and um i think that's what a lot of people are waiting for i, I think it's going to be similar to what you you mentioned earlier about the technological advances and now things are just going to be the communication is going to be much clearer i think with with potential clients and and with vendors, it's just you know it's, I think it's going to be the same at the restaurant where, you know, we have to have a lot of communication with people about when you're coming, how long you're going to be there, what the protocol is going to be exactly. like. Which ultimately, in in our line of work, is a good thing, right? I mean, we're always looking to get a more candid audience and and connect like eye to eye. Forget the social media, like you can't you can't enjoy my food through Instagram. You know, you can't buy a home through Facebook, or can you? <laughs> Uh, you can. <laughs> you can. can. Totally yeah. can. Jesus. Yeah. I don't, I'm not well. saying you should, but you can. <laughs> right. um, wow. I, I would say also, you know, um, yet to that point, we're going to, some of the new innovations are not going to go away. And, and we also still have yeah. to be sensitive to the fact that there still is a, a terrible health crisis going on. And everybody's receiving it in a different way. Some people are, you know, you have the, the group that's, that doesn't seem to be as concerned anymore. And you have still have a lot of people that are very, very concerned. And so we're going into apartment buildings with all types of people in them. And we have to be very sensitive to, you know, keeping people comfortable and safe. And um, so, you know, just because this, the state says we can show properties doesn't mean we necessarily right. always will. Uh, there are still co-op buildings that are saying we're not ready yet. Right. Um, and, um, and, you know, we're going to be a little more careful about how things are done. I'm, you know, 
I think a lot of agents, including our team, um, are asking for a little bit more uh, due diligence on any buyers that want to come up, come in. You know, we don't want, whereas we might have had an open house before and anyone can just walk in and, and walk around. You know, if you're going to have an appointment, we want to know that this is a serious situation and, and qualify that buyer a little bit more. Um, and, um, and the video thing's not going away. It's just going to get better and better. And mm -hmm. so, you know, any buyer that wants to come into any listing of mine is I want to make sure that they've watched the video and looked at all the photos and the floor plans and really, really are serious and want to come see it before, you know, I expose them to that property and vice versa. Right. And yeah. I think that's going to be the new, the new normal for a while, at least. But that's, it's a great opportunity to, like you said earlier, you're always, you know, trying to research and, and get better. It's a wonderful opportunity to just like take it to the next level and and become that like real estate superhero that you're always telling me about. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, but yeah. I, I feel the same, I feel the same with everything that we're doing as well. It's like this, it's it sure, you know, there's there's a fine line we have to tread. Um, but at the end of it, it gives us that that chance to just like show how awesome we can be and how much we care about Well you know I, I know you're time, interview sorry. yeah I know you're interviewing me but I can I ask you a question? Yeah, go for it. So what have you thought about how like reservations will work? Are you putting, you, are you thinking about putting timelines on how long someone can stay so someone else can get in? You know, what is that conversation going to be? Like? Yes. Um, it matters for me too, because yeah. I spent a lot of time in your restaurant. So I, <laughs> right. Um, yes, we will, we will go hard on reservations but not with the outdoor seating because i i used to work at a place in lower manhattan that was like 80 percent of the seating was outdoors and it was really tough to take reservations because of weather and then when you can't offer them anything inside what do you do then yeah. and and when you're using reservation platforms they're charging you for that service um so while we're we're doing outdoor i you know if someone calls me and it's a nice day of uh, another you know lady that from the neighborhood walked by yesterday her and her husband come in all the time and she said, are you going to take reservations? And I said, you know, I'm not going to, not going to use like a platform, but if you call me and you're like, Hey, it's me, you know, we want to come in in an hour, I'll hold a table for you. It's just going to be old school for right now. But once we can seat in the dining room, we have to very clearly uh, talk about timelines for people, um, spatialization, you know, and, and really push, uh you know it, i i think it's going to be mainly reservations because we're going to have to make adjustments in terms of our staffing and everything i mean we're still we're not out of the woods you know i stayed open this whole time but it was it was not a cakewalk and we're not you know we're not like financially okay and just because we can start to take a few tables doesn't mean all of a sudden like oh relief it's it's going to be it's going to be a, I, I i'm assuming like through the end of the year you know at least it's going to be like still an uphill battle Kind of like those guys climbing the walls with the, you know, with the pegs. Like you can just go a little bit each time, and it's always there's always this chance that you could just fall. That's how I, I feel like things are going to go. But again, it's just another great opportunity for us to connect with people, to maintain communication and outreach, and to show our values. You know, that's right. So and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and you know, there there is, I I really tread carefully on this topic because I hate to say that there's positivity coming out of a horrible situation, which is absolutely horrible. But one of the things that I've noticed is, um, you know, waiting for your takeout outside of your favorite restaurant. Suddenly you're in conversations with people that you probably were never going to end up talking yeah. to. And for me, uh, I, it may not seem that way, but I actually have trouble being outgoing. <laughs> and I don't get that. <laughs> well, you fake it till you make it, right? Yeah. Um, but um, I found myself talking to people that I probably would never have spoken to and engaging conversations and actually feel more a part of the community now than I ever have before. That's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. To that effect, we're going to have to wrap it up. Where can people in the community find you? Where, like, digitally, outreach, how can people connect with you? You can type in my name, Tyson Lewis Halstead. Or Tyson Lewis Real Estate into Google, and I'll pop right up on my Halstead's website. And uh, you know, you can you can always come to 
come to Della and order the amazing pesto and ask. You were supposed to say it there. three times. You you failed. You only said it once. No, I'm kidding. Um, and and Instagram too. You you're pretty active on Instagram. That's right. like your main Which platform. Is uh, what is it? <laughs> At Tyson Lewis Real Estate. I'm telling you, you got to get on that TikTok tip. That's next. Talking about video. Okay. My my assistant is a millennial, so we're. <laughs> You need you got to get a Gen Z for TikTok though. Then millennials don't even know what's going on with that. It's changing too quickly, man. It's like real estate. Well, I have a 13 year old daughter, so there you go. There you go. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I look forward. Your table awaits you. <laughs> Be our thank guest. You so much. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Tyson. You take care. You all have a great weekend. Stay safe. Be careful out there in phase two. But you know, we gotta we gotta we gotta do our best. So you do your best. We'll do our best. Have a great weekend. You're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web.